All right. Praying effectively. So, the word is designed to open our understanding, to help us see from God's perspective, right? <coughs> Excuse me. And this is what we're going to study. Praying effectively. So, in this series, we'll be giving you insight and definite and different applications in your spiritual walk. I believe many wonderful Christians like yourself would enjoy abundant life more if they just knew what to do, when, and how to do it, right? This will be our fun series. We've already been in a couple of weeks of this, teaching you uh, some practical truths to apply for yourself and understand. You see, we have been given spiritual authority, but you know we misuse that? In order for you to give orders, what's the first thing you need to do? Well, she said part of that, humble. In order for you to have authority, what is the first thing you need to do? You need to humble or you need to surrender to the ultimate authority. Remember, Jesus was really impressed when he went to the centurion and the centurion came to him, he says, look, I got a servant home sick. Jesus said, I'll come heal him. And the, and the centurion says, no, I'm not worthy that you should come to my house. You speak the word only. And then he goes on and he says, I'm a man under authority and I have people under me. And I say this, do this, and they do it. And go here, and they go. And Jesus was marveled. Because the key to anyone using God's authority is you have to submit to God. So that you are in harmony to use his authority. Can you say amen? A lot of people are shouting and trying to use God's authority, but they're not in harmony. Same with prayer. Did you know if you're a husband and wife and you argue and fight, your prayers are automatically hindered? Hello. So the best thing to do if you get into a little spat, be wise enough, one of you, maybe both of you, to say, whoa, we just shut down our prayer life. Let's fix that. To put your value on things above, right? Instead of who's important or who wins the argument. <clears throat> we want things to work, don't we? Can you have unforgiveness and go to heaven? No. You can't be in a position of, of being full of unforgiveness and, and go into heaven. If you stand praying and won't forgive, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you your trespasses. Even if you're saved, it will block you, okay, from going. Hello? I'm not saying you lose your salvation. Clarify your, your thing. Say it again. Oh, no, you don't lose your salvation. But if you're trying to follow God and you refuse to forgive somebody, your prayers are just shut right down. And your, your course heading towards heaven has just been stopped. For God resists the what? And, re and gives grace to the? So you don't lose your salvation. It's just all of a sudden you stop. Now, if you're in a hurry to get things done, oh, uh, no. If you're headed towards God, you don't want anything hindering you, do you? So unforgiveness is out. Fighting with your spouse is out. Being mad at God is out. Can you say amen? Because what happens? Our prayers become Hindered. Okay, one more thing before we continue on. What's the greatest tool that a Christian has? Prayer. So why would we want to destroy the greatest power that we have? Access to God and his influence. So it's not worth being mad at somebody, is it? It's not worth arguing. Trying to be right, is it? It's not worth running around picking on faults, is it? Why? Because we lose out in our ability to commune with God. 
Everyone say amen. Well, can we ask for forgiveness? Immediately you can. But the idea is to catch yourself before anybody else does. All right. Are you still with me? I got a hiccup here, so I've been waiting for the hiccup. All right. So true Bible teachers, and the Bible itself teaches us that we have an enemy, and he does not like us. So already recognize that. You can't buddy up with him. Hey, I'll make a deal with you. <laughs> hey, no, we can't. And if he could, he would uh, prevent us from reaching our goals and becoming all that we could be. Now, we know that, right? So let's look at what the scripture says about praying effectively. All right. So automatically, we have forgiveness, don't we not? Okay, but we just got through reading that we can get in a situation where our flesh can hinder our prayers. All right, so let's go with us to uh, Luke, uh, excuse me, go to the text, Luke 11, ver verse 1. All right, follow along if you have it. If not, I'm just going to read it to you. Now, I, it came to pass when he was praying, this is Jesus, in a certain place, when he ceased, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to what? Pray just as John taught his disciples. Now, if you read the rest of that text, the, the disciples realized that here Jesus and his power and influence was because he talked with God. Okay, remember, they didn't have the revelation yet that he was God. So they knew that this man was coming as a prophet, priest, and king and prophesied as the Messiah. But they don't really kind of, you know, remember Thomas and all those people. But when they saw him talk with God, miracles happened. So what did they ask him? What's the key? Prayer, right? <clears throat> First Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Here's how God wants us to pray. It says, Paul writing to Timothy, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications... That's the old word for petitionings, holding God's word up. That's holding God's word up, prayers, intercessions, giving thanks, be made for how many men? Yes. Didn't Jesus say, pray for your enemies? Amen. To kings, or for kings, and for all those who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and what? Peaceable life in all goodness and reverence. <clears throat> Verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God and the Savior, who desires all men to be what? Saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So in other words, we should pray for our nation. We should pray for our local government. We pray for those people in authority. Can you say amen? Pray for your officer when he's writing you a ticket. <laughs> amen. You, the idea behind it is, is we don't want to be children of God so wrapped up and antagonistic in our prayers. Oh, it's the devil doing this and the devil, and they're all upset all the time. God wants you to walk in confidence and in peace knowing that God is your source, God is your power, but you don't want to unplug that power by being foolishly fleshly. Can you say Amen. You know, and that's just what we do. So God wants us to pray for all, buddy. Our first point, a pure heart of prayer. First of all, prayer is something that's love. It's actually putting aside yourself, praying for someone else usually, isn't it? I mean, I remember several times it was praying for me. <laughs> putting myself aside, help God, help God. But besides that, you're putting time aside to be with God. Amen? And you don't want to bring in all your packages. Right? And then that's what I learned where, where God actually said to me, son, I don't want to hear about what you're experiencing. I want to hear from you. I want you to ask me to help you. I want you to ask me what hurts. Tell me what hurts, but don't go into detail. Remember, I live in you. I can tell you more about you than you can tell about yourself. So don't try to fill me in what I know. Fill me in what you need and reflect the word to me. So he began to teach me it's very important in prayer 
that you lift the word up to God and say, God, you said in your word, not, not as a smart aleck, but as a reminder. Now, you got, well, God knows everything. Why should I have to remind him? Because he said to remind him. If God tells you to remind him, but you think he doesn't need to be reminded, who's right? God. Right? If God says, call on me and I will answer, and you're rocking around waiting for God to answer before you call on him, you see? So sometimes we need to listen to the wordage. So, all right, prayer, a pure heart. What's it say? Blessed are pure in heart, for they shall see God. The Greek says, perceive God and have an understanding of him. Woo! But if you have a pure heart, God will sit down with you and reveal himself to you. That sounds good to me. Say amen. So pure heart of prayer. Prayer is communication with God out of love. It's done in Jesus' name out of a pure motive or pure heart. Prayer is an act of love to God and for others. As we offer our prayer, we should be washed and clean and have a selfless attitude. Can you say amen? Don't pray this prayer. God, get them. You know, rain down on them. Put up a, a heap of coals on their head. You start praying that way. As you sow, you shall reap. Now, God's not going to answer that prayer. But eventually, the enemy does catch wind of those things. Hello? I had a guy one time say to me, and I was trying to figure out what he, what he was doing, how he was thinking. He says, well, well, I always do unto people as they do to me. So if they're rude to me, then I'm rude to them. Does that sound really good? He thought it was scriptural. Bless his heart. So if somebody ever said something wrong to him, he treated him rude for months. Now, I would say that was unforgiveness, and I would say probably his prayers never got answered. See, Satan's very crafty. It's stealing. Conning us out of things. Working. See, that's why we don't slip into our mind and start applying our mind because our mind has been partly programmed by him. You don't believe me? Come on, shut off all that negative thoughts. See somebody you were mad at two years ago. See how many of those thoughts come floating back on through your head. Doesn't mean you're sinning, just don't talk them. <laughs> Remember thoughts die unborn, unspoken. All right, so here we go. So prayer is, again, communication. As we offer prayer, it should be washed and clean, right? God, so what I like to do is I like to come in and I say, Lord, you're beautiful and you're absent. I just take a few, few minutes or so to let him know I love him. And God shows me it just connects to his heart. And then the first thing I want to do is to be clean. I want it not to be offensive or clean. So I simply say, God, cleanse and wash from me anything that's offensive. If I have personality traits, if I have anything, Lord, work in me and take this out of me. You see, cleanse me so that when I pray for others, I don't install what I think they need, but instead I ask that you give them what they really need. <coughs> Can, oops, sorry. Can you understand that? Are you with me? So we're not injecting our own thoughts concerning someone, especially if we really don't know what they need. Maybe we know they have a hang-up or something, but we don't know what their heart's crying out. So you just say, God, go into their hearts and what the part of that heart is broken and the way they're thinking about things that is wrong, causing this situation, straighten it out. Open their eyes. You see, now you're giving God to go in, the right to go in, because the person themselves not asking. You're interceding and bringing God in on behalf of another, and you're giving him the liberty to go in and, and pop anything of fears, hurts, pains out of their heart. So you can actually become an artist in prayer. In fact, here's the problem. Many prayer warriors have not gone on to be with Jesus. 
Some of the finest warriors and prayer warriors in the world that brought the revivals in the 60s, in the 50s, and the 40s are the, all the laborers of people in prayer praying for God's power to come and manifest. The only problem is people like me and others who experienced the latter end of that revival, it wasn't our prayers that caused it. It was the prayers that went on before. We're just reaping some of the benefits. Now, what do we do? Just reap the benefits and don't plow the field? We don't learn to pray. We don't learn to pray for our children and grandchildren, our relatives, our nation. This is the greatest power in the world for a Christian is to be able to close the door, shut the world out, and talk to Almighty God is waiting for invitations into people's lives. My, your prayer might be the only invitation into somebody's life that they ever get. And because you prayed and asked for them to be saved, God honored your prayer and led them to a place where they could hear the gospel and make a decision for themselves. Hello. So the art of prayer, Satan's almost shut it off. Now we hear about these great big prayer sessions and everything like that, but if you go to them, they're not praying. They're, they're having a big worship thing and it, it goes on for hours and then the people pray kind of hang around no it should be on your face first and then after the victories went in prayer then sing the songs hello but we need to go in see if you're a good farmer I mean James uses this expression I know I'm talking a little about but James used the expression of a farmer how he chills the ground and he labors and he waits for the early rain and waits for the seed to, to begin, and he waits for the crop, you know, and he's not in a big hurry because he knows his labors are not in vain. So is the prayer warrior who hearts goes after the souls and after a full church and after all the equipment. You work in a department, you should be praying over your equipment that everything functions and everything. You should be so prayed up about all that that you just already know it's taken care of. Because you spent time talking to the master about it. Hello? And God's just waiting to be invited in. You know, just waiting to be involved in a greater way. So that's what prayer is, just the beginning of what it's about. Are you with me? But when we approach God, we don't want to come in all dirtied and fleshy out. Because the Bible says when we do approach God, it says for us to take off our old man Lay it down on the altar, doesn't it? But many Christians today think they can walk through the day what we call little pop prayers. Oh, Lord, help me with this pop, 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 and everything. And it'll go great for a little while. Then when the pressures start to build up, it drives them right on their face. And things break. No, you start off and you do all your calisthenics first thing in the morning. And if you do it on a regular basis, you won't find yourself having to pray five hours for the mess you got yourself into. Hello? You meet with God on such a, a, a regular basis, it creates such a love affair that you can't even exist a day without having to meet with him and getting the fresh instructions, like you say, the peace and that confidence that you need, that he breathes in you. I don't know how people can exist without it. Now listen, I was in the ministry. I prayed. I did all those things, but not like I do now because I did not know the value of it. But when I begin to see the people that did pray, no matter what, they were so solid. And the people that just were busy, they were always upset. And yet they knew the word, but the one difference is the, the presence of God and that quieting and power effect when we spend time with them. Someone say amen. Listen to this one. 1 Peter 3 verse 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And the Bible says, If we have Jesus in our heart, then we are the righteousness of God now. Because of Christ in us. You know, he who knew no sin, Jesus, was made to be sin for us. That we accepting him become the righteousness of God. In Christ. Can you say amen? And the beautiful part of that is the eyes of the Lord are always on you. Because you're not an offense. You have his son. 
or over the righteous, and his ears are always what? Always open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. All you have to do, if you're concerned about people, you know, ruining things, and I mean serious things like, you know, people that murder babies for abortion rights and all that kind of stuff, God's face is against that. All you have to do is study rebuking and screaming. Just say, Father, your face is against evil. And this situation here is evil. And Lord, I'm your covenant child. I'm asking you to deal with it and fix it. All you have to do is say that. And every time it comes to mind, you just say, thank you, Lord, that you're fixing it. You see, when I'm praying for my country, I pray for Israel, my country, my blood family, Linda's, we're a blended family. And I pray for our church family and the future church family that's come in. I do that every day, but I don't pray the same prayers over and over again. I, 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 I change them. I first pray the prayer, Lord, for my country and everything. And then I say, Lord, I thank you that you're watching over my country. Now guide me over specifics. And next thing you know, I, I'm worshiping over that prayer, and he starts telling me to pray for legislation and pray for this bill. And I don't know what bill, but this bill's coming to the house, you know. And so he can guide you in the specifics if you would just let him. But what we tend to do is to pray this, Lord, watch over our nation. Thank you, God. And the next day, oh, Lord, thank you for watching over our nation. Thank you, Lord, for watching over our nation the next day. And don't, go, don't do it like that because, it, because of the way we're designed. It has a tendency to recede us into a ritual and not out of a, a, a heart. So what you do is you change it. So, Lord, thank you for our nation. And I know I said that yesterday and the day before. But now, Lord God, I want you to go in and touch this area. And if you're stumbling over words, now you're given direction in that area. And he'll guide you. Can you say amen? But don't feel bad if you're bringing it up over and over again. Don't feel bad. Just slap the thing. Slap this on it. Thank you that you're doing this, Lord. Thank you that you're saving my son. Thank you you're saving my brother. Instead of, instead of Lord, save so-and-so. It's like you didn't, you know, you thought he didn't hear the first time. <coughs> Sorry again. But that's not the case. The case is he hears fine. He doesn't want you to think that you're making him do it through the multitude of you bringing it up all the time. What he wants you to do is believe that you receive it and then slap your hand on it and thank him. Believe that you receive your brother's salvation. And every time, every morning, say, oh, thank you for saving my brother, Lord. <laughs> he has got it now. <laughs> Chase him right on down, Lord. And just change it. Laugh a little bit. Because what do you want? You only want the best. So add some personality in there and have fun with God. You might eat, huh? You, we haven't got to that part yet, but. And use your language. But most people, they've shut their language down so long, they don't know if they could talk in tongues anymore. Well, for heaven's sake, remember that spiritual language you had when you were born, physically born. It was alive in your spirit until you got old enough to know the difference between right and wrong. And if some of us, I can remember, some of us can remember when that switch was turned off, when we got so and we did that one thing, we knew suddenly we're on our own. We switched off from being accountability and now we separated. And that's why we have to be born again. Our spirit has to be relit. So the old Pentecostals used to teach that God had a special gift of the Holy Spirit, which he does. But they made it a little package with tongues on it. And the tongues you already had in your spirit. See, God does not give you anything new as far as his promises or what he's originally designed to be in you. He gave you yourself back and he put himself in it to see you get there. So he relit our spirit, 
came in to live in our spirit. Now it's us and God, God and us, and we are a moving team, can you say amen? And our prayers what fires it up. And then we become creative in our prayer because the creator himself lives in our heart. So he let him guide you in your prayers. Man, it gets exciting. When you pray and suddenly you see results of the following day in people's lives, instead of getting all upset about it, pray about it first. God can deal with people. He knows how to pull that little cork out of that bottle. Can you say amen? amen. So the eyes of the Lord, though, are against the wicked. Look at Mark, what Mark 11, 20, uh, 5 and 26 says. Listen to this. And whenever you stand praying, does that mean we can sit and pray? No, <laughs> we can do anything in prayer. When you are stand praying or when you're making, here's the way it really sounds. Whenever you stand making prayer, when you're standing to make prayer, doesn't mean standing up. It means you're standing for something in prayer. How many are standing for this nation in prayer? So you're standing for the nation in prayer. If you stand, how many are standing for part of your family in prayer? Okay, then you're standing for your family in prayer. How many are standing for some finances in your life? Well, then you're standing for your finances. You understand? But when you're standing in prayer, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them. And you'll know. You won't have to stand in prayer and think, all right, Lord. Who is it now? <laughs> minute you start praying with a pure heart, which you have, God will bring somebody right up to your head. When there's a blockage, you'll just bring it right up. All you have to say, Lord, I forgive them. Even though you don't want to, say out loud, I forgive them. You cannot forgive in your head. You have to say with your lips, especially if you went and talked about them. Or about them or whatever. You have to say, God, I, I let it go. I forgive them. Have them forgive me, Lord. I let it go. And when you say it, he'll give you the strength to let it go. And the first thing your mind will tell you, no, you're still mad. Tell your mind to shut up. That's exactly what it is. A rebellious little foolish thing. And a lot of Christians have never dealt with their thinking. It's time we do. Because it'll come right up when you really need to hear from God. Your head will start popping off. Let me see the hands of those that ever had that happen. All of you, see? That's, that's what the enemy does. He tries to pop your head off to try to get you to shut down. Stop that. Just stop that. You're going to get the results. Stop that. Get sidetracked. Do something. Hello? Somebody asked the other day, a long time ago, why does it take certain times in prayer? Certain Well, could be unforgiveness, could be something that you're doing, could be something that the person, if there's people involved, could be a lot of things. But instead, stop trying to figure it out. Go back to praying and thanking God and move on to something else. But if you're dwelling on some why isn't it, why isn't it, then the enemy's catching you. He's getting you to focus on that. no. You cast the carol, that's, where you, that's what you cast over on the Lord. Because it can't sit on your head. How many have ever sat on something in your head long enough to make your head hurt? Don't raise your hand. I think all of us have done that too. Remember, trying to figure things out is not a good thing. Hello? Not without prayer first. Someone say Amen. You go out and do a project and you start doing a project because you think you know. Well, God could have said, it's slippery. Ah! You pray first every project. Everything you pray first. And ask God's wisdom on it. You go see your relatives and they're a little edgy. Pray first. You see, but we don't. And then we pray after. And we have to clean up messes that are unnecessary. Some would say, oh, me? All right, come on, I'm ministering. This is this effective prayer. So you don't want, the first thing, when you go to meet with God, make sure you are washed up, you're cleansed. Okay, and here's what I mean by that. Don't take a shower. 
you know, brush your teeth. Just say, Lord, cleanse me from anything that would hinder my prayers. And if there is something, bring it up. And then you just proceed on. Can you say amen? amen? All right. And you proceed on and you talk with God. Because when you ask him, he does it, doesn't he? Right. Don't even be, as a Christian in the New Testament, don't even think about ask and you ask amiss. That's in James, right? Pray when you people pray to heap it upon their flesh, and it says they pray and don't get because they ask and miss or ask a miss. It's an old English word. They ask for the wrong reasons. But see, he's talking to Jews, isn't he? He's in the Jewish mindset. Well, listen. Is immediately when you ask for something that's wrong, your spirit, which has God in it, will check you. You won't have the Jewish mindset here. God rain fire down on those Gentiles, those scurmy dogs. That's how the Jews thought. See, you see? And make sure you have forgiveness before you offer your prayer. <laughs> you guys are not laughing. This is the tr I'm trying to tell you the truth. Really, they wouldn't even look a Gentile's way. That's how bad the Satan had gotten them. And when Jesus showed up, he didn't look like him. He didn't smell like him. But he certainly was a lot better than any of them. And all they could see was the difference. What has Satan got everybody doing right now? Noticing everybody being different. No. Notice everybody. Find something that you like about somebody. Focus in on it. Find, we all have something in common. Find that. Don't look at difference. Look at what's common. Look at what good we have. We have the same God. Can you say amen? That's how Satan does. He gets us in a box. We analyze the box. We analyze why, why, oh why. Poor me, oh me. And immediately our prayers are hindered. And yet we talk to the, the one who created it all. And has all the wisdom. And you have the ability to sit down with him. And you only give them 10 minutes. It's quiet in here. And I know it's, it's really hard to spend a good, good hour or two. But try it sometime. You go in and let God take you completely over. Get so caught up. I mean, time will be nothing to you anymore. But, you know, it has to be a time where you can do that. You can't just put every sign. Hey, honey. I'm not coming to work today. I'm going to spend time with God. You're fired. <laughs> Complete lack of wisdom. Hello. <laughs> All right, moving right along. Okay, so Mark 11, 25. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. That your Father in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. So immediately you're in a deadlock. You're in a stalemate. We don't want that. Can you say amen? You're not leaving your salvation. But think about it. God's going to take us home, right? He's going to come and he's going to rapture us home. So you are standing there after God has been asking you for days. Forgive them. Forgive them. Please forgive them. And you don't. And the rapture will come and the rapture will go. And you'll be standing right there in unforgiveness. That's one of the defiant things will keep you from going. Is you refusing to forgive somebody. That's how bad it is. Now who said that? Me? Is this the Pastor Kerry doctrine? No, Jesus said this. He was giving us the wisdom to avoid this. Can you say amen? Avoid it. Do you remember? Well, it seems like I get caught up in it. Well, those are the days you don't pray. You ever notice that? The days you have the worst are the days you don't talk to God. Smile up at me. Everybody look at me. It, it smile like you would never do that. Amen. All right. Psalms, look at this. Psalms 86, verse 18. Or is that 56? 66. 66. That's all right. Amen. 
It, it says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will what? Now, re to regard iniquity means that you want to be secretive about something, something like unforgiveness. I, here's what I, I'm not talking about. I remember years and years ago used to be the big thing for like the men's ministry to get together. And then they would get this book, Men's Secret Sins. And then they would try to study all through that and try to hold together a men's ministry. First of all, your secret sins, nobody needs to know but God. And you need to go to God about those things, not the church. Hello? Not confide in men and women in the church. Okay, the church is not Jesus. We're just an out reflection of Jesus. We do what we can. But you go to the priest, Jesus. You talk to Jesus about your secret little things. Those little aches and those pains and those little things you think you're getting away with, which you're not. God works with you and he loves you through them, see. But if, you, but if it keeps you like it did Adam in the bushes hiding, that's not a good thing. Hello. So if we regard iniquity means that we refuse to deal with something in our life, then God will tune out, tune you out. Because you're in the flesh. Doesn't mean you're not saved. Just means he tunes you out. Okay? Now that's not to say you, you secretly went out and you snuck a nip. What it, that's an old word my mom used to use when she take a glass of wine when my dad didn't like it. I hit a nip. Just no, okay? I mean, this is years and years ago, back before they were saved. But I'm relating to you. So sometimes we think we're going to do something that nobody else knows. That's ridiculous. Okay, just stop that. And besides, if you, nobody else knows, but God and you didn't talk to God and let God help you through that. Don't buy a book and go tell everybody and make it a ministry. Hello? <laughs> you used to be a pervert, now you're going to be a ministry. You, you see how dumb some people do? And then they write stuff and they do stuff and they think it's a testimony. We talked about uh, tail bearing. I don't want to know all your dirty secrets. And I certainly don't want to buy a book and read about them. Hello? <laughs> all right. So I'm not picking on anybody in general. But just remember, the things that we hold secret, God shouts on the rooftops. So we go in and talk to the man about everything. He works out everything in our life. Hello? And that's how we get better. Have you noticed you've been getting better, all of you? And the time you stop getting better is it's time where you stop praying, you stop worshiping, stop being positive, you're arguing, you're frustrated, then things stop. So instead of having other people go, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Check yourself every other day. Say, Lord, how am I doing? What's going on with me? Make sure I don't get off the deep end. Thank you, Lord. Talk with God that way. That's why Jesus came. He's your shepherd. Hello? If your head's stuck in the pen, have him come over and get it unstuck. That's what prayer's all about, okay? Praying effectively is being gut honest and scripturally correct. Can you say amen? All right. A couple of things. Prayer is the lock at night. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you so much. You're watching over our family. Thank you, in Jesus' name, Father. You're watching over our church family. You're helping them with every decision, Father. You're making sure that they're, if they're in pain or, or they feel lonely, that you will comfort them, Father, in Jesus' name. And, Father, I now ask you, in Jesus' name, lock my subconscious mind from anything of the enemy that might suggest while I'm sleeping. Thank you, Lord. You can say, I plead the blood of Jesus over your minds, and then God just puts the old dome of protection on you while you rest. How many know God really wants us rested? Yeah. I mean, we're not any good to anybody if we wore out all the time. Say amen. And a person that prays a lot finds rest. Now, when I say pray a lot, I'm not talking about long lengths of time. I'm talking about spurts of time throughout the day. Yeah. Spurts of time. Stop, though. 
In your spur of time, don't be busy doing everything while you're trying to talk with God. That doesn't count. That's not a face-to-face. It, it counts as far as talking to God, but when you really need to get something off your heart, stop, pull over like you would your cell phone and talk with God for five minutes. Especially if you're upset about something. Hello? Moving right along. Prayer is an invitation to the supernatural, a door to the realm where God can walk us into experience. Hello? Many failures come through a lack of prayer, not wrong prayer. Hello? Did you know after Adam and Eve sinned, Nobody called on the name of the Lord till Genesis chapter 4. And you know who it was? I'll throw this out. It was Abel's blood from the ground. Who glory to God. Because people had gotten so angry at God and felt the fall of man and the disgust. Satan was right there to just pound on him. They didn't offer anything to God, but God was still there working them types and shadow until man got so corrupted. How long did it take him? Not very long. How many people do you think were on the earth at the time that Noah's flood? Anybody want to make a guess? I mean, who knows for sure? I guarantee it was over probably somewhere around 2 to 10, billion, uh, 10 million people. Okay? There was a lot. So that's a lot of dead bodies, a lot of corrupted people. And it was so bad, it was so bad that Satan had such much charge on it. But remember, God dealt with men through their conscience. After the fall of Adam and Eve, God dealt through man's conscience. He says, okay, man, you chose to do the wrong thing, so I'll deal with you, but it's only when your conscience cries out for help that I'll deal with you. And that's how bad mankind didn't take long. We see Genesis. We see Cain kill Abel. And then Genesis 5, we see basically the names. And all by the time of Genesis 8, there was only eight people left. Out of all of those people, they were unsavable. And people say, well, I don't understand why they were unsavable. Because they had a creature's blood in them that changed their DNA that no longer made them human. And God made us human. He didn't make us a hybrid of something else. You know, if that blows your mind, I don't want it to blow your mind. But if you think about it, it says that that the fallen angels came down and had sex with women to try to produce their own race of mankind. And we know that God's the only one that can create. The only thing Satan can do is make a mess. And that's what we're suffering with the mess he made. And that's why we pray. God knows we're in a fallen planet and we need help. So what did he do? He sent his son to come and rescue us. To pay for our penalties and write the debt. Then says, hey, catch a ride with me. I'm going to seal you. I'm going to mark you. And then I'm going to own you. Transform your life over to me. If you'll trust me, I will completely transform your life. But if you don't, I'll still save you and we'll get what we can. Hello? If God could have saved the whole, wouldn't you rather have him to save the whole and just a part? Amen. Let's move right along. Get you to think a little bit. And then prayer is a must. How many? So when you pray, not if you pray. Let me just tell you, if you learn to pray at an early state with your relationship with God, it will carry you through. A lot of people don't learn to pray. They get saved, they go to Bible study, they go to church, they love the Lord. But they have very little prayer life. And you know how I know? Because I'll ask them, would you like to pray over the meal? And they'll get so embarrassed that they, they won't pray over the meal. People who pray a lot have no problem. You have to ask them, stop praying. (laughs) I asked Denise to pray. (laughs) Here, here, 
I'm making this up, okay, for the people on the camera. Here's Sherry say, no, I want to pray. And Denise go, no, I want to pray. That's what I want to see. I want to see when we open the thing, people up here holding hands and praying before the service, praying in the glory of God, praying in the revival. We, we actually had that happen in my other churches because that's what we were doing. And we need to, we need to start doing it here again. But at one time, I got a picture. Somebody, our photographer, was going around, and there was about 10, 15 people praying. Remember seeing this, dear? Holding hands in the circle in the front of the church, praying for God to work and do miracles and stuff like that and everything like that. And he took a picture, and you could see the Holy Spirit floating around all the people, literally. And I, and I want to find that picture. I loved it. I want to start a... Um, a, uh, what is it called, a memory board of all my friends and stuff, like Rick Renner and all that. Put them all when they came to the church, Reba and McIntyre and, and uh, the Gaithers and all that kind of when they came to my church and, and stuff. It's hard to imagine this little guy right here, but I like to remember some of the things that God did to remind us that God is not done yet. He, he is not sitting down going, okay, we got to wait till these people are done doing this mess. And then we'll come and get you. No. He's waiting for people to stand up, folks. Where are our prayer warriors? Where are our intercessors? Where are our wonderful men and women of God? People like Oral Roberts has gone on. People like Kenneth Hagin has gone on. You know, gosh sakes. Who's the one that everybody loves the most? The evangelist, Billy Graham. Billy Graham could drop his pencil and tens of thousands of people get saved because God made him that anointed. It wasn't anything great and special. His sermons were plain and simple, but when he says it's time for you to receive Jesus, man, everybody went because God was calling. What caused that? People praying and asking for God to do unusual things. Sunday morning, before you even totally get dressed, you should already pray for the service. Everything to go right in the service. Every piece of equipment on the right of the service. Hello. And then when you got that covered, say, God, what else do you want me to cover? Walk around like a madman thinking, I'm going to pray for everything. <laughs> Just for the people in the camera. Just thought I'd fool around with you. I have a tendency to watch these periodically. That ought to look real good. All right, let's move on. Pray the word, folks, not the problem. Can you say amen? Pray the word. John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word. So when you learn to lift, say, Father, in the name of Jesus, and you know, you might take a pocket promise book or a prayer, a prayer that avail much book, and you can actually read the scripture and insert your names. Your Lord, I pray the spirit of wisdom rest on joy of the Lord fellowship. I pray that the spirit of wisdom and counsel and power and might be upon Sherry. I pray this in Jesus' name, you see. And you go through there and you insert people's name and you pray the word. Now, the word, if the word was God, the word still is. So if you pray the word, you're praying what? There you go. You're praying, God, can God deny himself? So when you say, Father, your word says, your word says. You're not trying to tell God he's, he's missing a few bricks. No, he says, your word say. And God says, good, you know my covenant. Boom. Good, you know my covenant. Boom. He's looking for faith. Didn't he say, when I come, shall I find faith in the earth? Hello? Or a bunch of Bailey acres? Crying out, oh, woe is me. All right, so if the, we pray the word to never inform God about your problems. Where did we come up with that anyway? You know my story. I'm telling God all about what I'm experiencing. And he stops me and he says, what are you doing? I says, Lord, I'm praying. He says, no, you're not. I says, yes, I am. He says, no, you're not. You ever argue with God? Doesn't work. I said, well, what am I doing then? Sounds like I'm being a smart aleck, but I'm not. He says, you're complaining. 
I already know about all what you're experiencing. I'm looking for you to hold my word up. I'm looking for you to speak my word so I can answer it. I can't say, yeah, I know you hurt. Yeah, I know you hurt. Isn't it unfortunate you hurt? Oh, you must hurt. I hear it coming out of you every day. You hurt, you hurt, you hurt. Now, would you speak my word so I can bring you out of yourself? His word, so he can bring you out of that. Hope that little revelation got you. Hope it, hope it really helped. Really, it's all about get, getting as effective. Can you say amen? Remember, God needs invitation. So be descriptive. You said it once, generally. Now become descriptive. Lord, I don't want him just to wear a tie. I want it to be a good looking tie. Lord, I don't want to just heal of that. Hey, get his bad dispen dispensational, irritational nut. Get that taken care of too. And when you pray for people who, who you know need help, don't forget to pray that you receive it. So it would sound like this. Lord, I can tell so-and-so is having a bad time. I don't know what's causing it. But bring about change. Help them to get through it. And at the same time, get me through whatever I need to. See, when you pray that way, you're not you and not me kind of thing. You follow what I'm saying? It's, it's more of a humble stance. Lord, I know you're working on me about my stuff, Lord. Help them with theirs. I don't know what it is, and it's none of my business. But I do know they're a wonderful or beautiful person. Bring out that beauty and do the same with me. Make me better. Should be your prayer every time, change me, make me better. Make me a better pastor. Make me a better husband. Make me a better wife. Change me, change me, Lord. And then he does. But if you never ask him to, guess what? Somebody else will embarrass you about it. The devil will remind you about it. And then you'll be on your face crying about it. And guess what? You finally got to the place of realizing you need a change. Now, wasn't that a waste of time? I'll take a sip on that little moment. So like the kid that falls down and sits in the mud puddle, miserable and irritated, and refuses to get up because he's going to punish Mama because she never saw him fall in the puddle. And so people that are ornery a lot of times stay ornery because you want to punish everybody else. Because now they feel rotten. I want to make everyone. Well, that's just human nature. Prayer will get rid of that. I said prayer will get rid of that. Amen. Because your flesh is your enemy, not your friend. That's why you're always cutting it, and bruising it, picking on it, and, and putting it down. Because you don't like the flesh. Nobody does. But some of us learn to ignore it. Some of us learn to bring it before God and have God deal with it. And some of us just let it run rampant and we never, never experience hardly anything good. And if we do, it's by accident. Now, there's a better life than that. Can you say amen? All right. For God to answer prayer, all he needs is faith in his word. That's it. Lift up, believe in him. Lord, I believe in him. And then this is your word. Thank you, Father. <clears throat> and immediately, if you're like me, Satan immediately would come to me and say, you're not going to get it. You yelled at your wife today. I'm just making that up, okay? I, then I start laughing. You know why? Because Satan can't tell the truth, can he? So if he tells you your prayers are not being answered, what do you know is being answered? Yeah. So when the devil tells you you're not saved, what do you know you are? If the devil says you're never going to amount to anything, what do you know you, you're, what are you doing? You're amounting to something. Remember, he comes to steal. He's not going to come and pat you on the back. So you know by the opposition sometimes you face that you're gaining ground and growing. No opposition sometimes, then you're not growing at all. You're taking a vacation. No responsibility needed. No. 
when you're advancing in God, a new level creates a new devil situation. Doesn't mean it's going to be bad. Now, do you guys know that the devil hears me preaching to you? Here's something that really was an eye-opener. My pastor taught me that what I teach you, you better pay attention. Because Satan believes you, you're going to believe what he says. So if I tell you that you should do it this way, and this is how it works, and you just shine me on and you don't, and the enemy comes to you and pounds on you, if you would have done it that way, you would have had complete victory with a notice, no difference. But you heard the word and did it not. And then the enemy came to you like you were going to do it, just to see if you would, you didn't, and you failed. God doesn't give up on you. You get up and you repeat the matter. You repeat the class, you flunk. You repeat the test, you failed. So if you have a problem with people, and whatever it is, doesn't matter, you will repeat that over and over and over again. Do you come to God and ask God to change you and alter you? And then you find out that lessons learned, you move on. Remember, you're running a race. And it's not a race against anyone else but your flesh. And it's a race for you to hit the spots and pick up the batons. Baton here, baton there, a baton there, baton there, baton there. Guided by the Spirit, you have a certain job to do that only you can do it, and you will be measured whether or not you followed instructions or not. And if some of you didn't, there'll be a lot of tears when you get to heaven, but you'll be in heaven. But there would be no rewards because the things God needed you to do, you didn't do. Okay? So if you didn't do what he needed you to do, it's no, no biscuit but you're still in heaven. That's 1 Corinthians 3, if you get a chance to read it tonight. You're bored and don't have anything to do. Okay, all right. <coughs> Excuse me. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, 17 through 19, and Ephesians 4, 12, and we'll cut it right there, okay? Because I'm going to go next week on more prayer. Would you like that? Thank you for that great amen. All right, so Ephesians 6, this is your scripture, now listen. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always. I like to kind of, kind of get a perspective. I'm sure this is really wonderful in the message, but I like to reverse the words like always praying. Then you get kind of a look at it a little differently. It says praying always or always praying with all Prayer. The Greek says all manner of prayer. Manner means all different kinds of styles. Did you know I found personally, looking at all the different ways in which people prayed, I found 22 different styles of prayer. Prayer of agreement, prayer of faith, prayer of renunciation, prayer of pronunciation, prayer of dedication, prayer of commitment. You see what I mean? But all of these usually come in when we pray. Lord, I commit, Lord God, to, to meet with you more often so you can bring about change in my, in my heart. There's nothing wrong with making a commitment, but you know God's got to help, help you to keep that commitment. Don't fall under condemnation if you don't. Remember, let your yea be yea and your what? Your nay, nay. Don't make any, any promises to God. Rather, don't. Just say, Lord, help me to be more faithful in this. That's a better way to do it. Instead of saying, Lord, I promise I'll be more faithful, Satan will come right, sit right on your head and just show everybody. I mean, my big problem was I was unorganized. So the enemy, every time it came time to organize something, I guess who would be unorganized? Other people said, well, come on now, oh, you know. And so when I learned a new job, I had to remember my tools what time, where I was supposed to be, at what time. So I learned organization is very, very important. How many know that God's very organized? Amen. But some people think organization has to do with uh, human manipulation. No, God is very organized. You notice he, he puts your body together, it functions, doesn't it? Wonderfully, fearfully made. 
He's put order in the Old Testament, uh, how to do certain, how to make certain things, right? He told them how to handle the ark, and when they didn't do it that way, what happened? They died. Amen. Well, we're in the New Testament now, but let's say God gave you a gift, but you never listened to how he wanted you to use that gift, and you just went out and you used it. Could you have gotten more results if you would have listened to God along the way or would have been just utilizing the gift God gave you? Well, you know the answer to that. And so God wants and expects for us to meet with him so we understand how he functions and flows so we can get his rhythm. His rhythm and function and flow. He has a rhythm for everything. And once you get in that rhythm, I mean, you, even if you fell down, you'd fall down smoothly. You know, it just has that togetherness about his rhythm. Why? Because you're leaning on. Leaning on Jesus. Amen? So finally it says, look, put on the helmet of salvation. In other words, understand that over your head, when you are walking with Jesus, your head doesn't wander. When you say, Father, God, and you meet with God, and you say, now I'm leaving, Lord, let's walk together through this day. Your head will stay right on. It won't wander because you've got a helmet on. And that helmet keeps you locked in that you're saved. That's what that is. It's a description of a helmet that keeps you thinking on God. Helmet of salvation and the sword of the big S. Sword of the Spirit, Holy Spirit. So literally the Holy Spirit in you you should have enough understanding of the word that the Holy Spirit can take the word, pull it out of your soul, and fling it at the enemy, fling it at, the, at a cancer, or pray for somebody in your family who needs salvation. Because he takes the sword of the Spirit, which is God and the Word of God, and he gets things done. If we'll get ourselves out of the way and build a prayer habit. Say amen. So we just ask God to help us to do that. All right, so Hebrews 4, 12 tells us that the word of God is living. So now you know it's God, see? But it will never come alive off that page until you spend a little time in prayer getting your spiritual eyes and spiritual man aware. You just can't flop the Bible open and expect to get a lot out of it. You will get some out of it. But you won't get what God wants you to get out of it until you prepare your ground, your heart to receive the word that you're reading and studying. So the word of God is living and powerful. It's exploding, energizing, it means. The word is living and energizing and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's like a razor blade. Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. Everyone say soul and spirit. Where does God live? He lives in your spirit. Some people will loosely say, oh, God's in my soul. No. Your soul is a part of your heart. But God lives in your spirit, influencing your heart. So God in your spirit influences your soul by the eyes of your understanding becoming enlightened and you go into prayer with God where he seals the deal and makes the word a living thing in you. See, it's God who makes God living in you off the page. So when you take a little time and pray, says, Lord, open my eyes, let me hear what you're saying off this page. God will start speaking to you loud and clear right off the word of God. All right, I'm about ready to let you go. So it's quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing and inviting between what your spirit is and what your soul is, between your joint and your marrow, your connector between your spirit and your soul, and is a discerner of how you think and the intents of what you intend to do. So the Word of God will let you know if you're going to do something, you're doing it in the wrong spirit. Stop. And the Word of God will let you know, do it and I will anoint you. Go. Can you say amen? So we want to be in prayer so he can take what word we know and breathe more life into it. If you got something out of that tonight, would you give the Lord a praise? Amen.